All right. Well, welcome everybody. It is 1.30. Um, good to, good to, good to, I guess, connect with you all over Zoom. Um, so thanks for tuning in. First of all, um, I am Flori Pieri. I'm the curator at the Sarnoff Collection over at the College of New Jersey. Um, for those of you who might not know who we are, uh, we are a history of electronics, uh, history of communication technology museum. Uh, I like to say that we are the best museum on the College of New Jersey's campus. We are also the only museum, but we're still pretty good. Um, so uh, before, uh, before New Jersey shut down, we had planned for this exhibit, In Living Color, to talk about the history of color television. And unfortunately, our opening day was slated for the first week that the university was closed. Um, so we were sort of scrambling for what to do and we decided that we would just put all of our material online, change, um, change our, um, sorry, put all of our material online and change our talks from being in-person talks to being Zoom talks. So thank you for being our first uh, guinea pig today. Um, you can find our online exhibit if you're interested in, uh, if you're interested in it at our uh, Omeka site. Uh, I will type it in in the chat for you, sarnoff.omeka.net. And there you can see, um, there you can see not just uh, In Living Color, but a couple of our other exhibits as well. We've got one on Joseph Weisbecker um, and his sort of tabletop computer games. We have one on television repair. Uh, we have another one on early computer games. So it's a lot of fun. Hopefully you can uh, check that out. Uh, but today I'm going to talk to you about color television, because what is TV without color? And while it seems so natural to us, I mean, you're all looking at my screen in color, our TV shows are in color by default and we're sort of accustomed to carrying screens capable of displaying color in our pockets, really the road to color television wasn't exactly smooth sailing. And the ultimate adoption of a color TV standard in the United States was the result of a really long fought battle between companies, regulatory agencies, and the public. Um, and along the way, there were plenty of stops and starts. There were a couple of wars, cold and otherwise. Um, there were several attempts at 3D television. Uh, there are a couple of stories about blue bananas. Um, and finally, at the very end of our story, there's going to be an all electronic backwards compatible color television system. So please join me as we dive into the wonderful world of color. So engineers had been dreaming of television since the late 19th century, but in the early 20th century, TV seemed finally like an invention that was right around the corner. And since dreams were cheap, uh, engineers were dreaming in color. The first patent for a rudimentary color TV system was issued in Germany in 1902, uh, with other uh, patents following suit over the next two decades. But by the 1920s, research into TV increased at an ever frenzied pace, and it seemed that monochrome television, at least, was right around the corner. And while there is no one inventor of color television, just like there is no one inventor of black and white television, um, there were a couple of key figures along the way, alongside all the hundreds of people around the world who worked on everything from radio to telephotography. And one of these people, the person who can be credited with being the very first to successfully display a color television system, was the Scottish inventor John Logie Baird, who held a color TV demonstration in his London labs in 1928. So that seems uh, a little weird. 1928, we have our very first successful color television broadcast. We don't get color television until much, much later. Um, and to give you a sense of the chronology, the US didn't get commercial black and white TV until 1939, more than a decade after Baird's um, experimental color TV system. And it's gonna take several more decades in order for the American consumer to go out and be able to buy an affordable color TV set. So what gives? Why did color television take so long? 
Well, the main problem is that color television is actually really hard to do and it's hard to do right. It's much harder than monochrome television. So Baird left off serious work on color TVs until the 1930s, uh, when he began again with his attempts to create a true to life television system. Uh, and for Baird, he insisted that he was going to create 3D television in color. That was the most lifelike system he can think of. Meanwhile, in the United States, uh, Bell Laboratories was also developing a working color television system. Uh, they had one uh, in 1929, uh, but theirs was not based on a broadcast model, uh, but on a point-to-point -point system, sort of like a visual telephone. You can think of it as a very rudimentary version of Zoom. Um, the image that you would see of the other person would be about the size of a postage stamp. But it wasn't just Bell Labs who was working on television in the United States. Vladimir Zworkin, who at the time was working for the Westinghouse Corporation, um, and Peter Goldmark, who was an engineer at the Columbia Broadcasting System, they also were working on color TV. So Zworkin, uh, the man on the right, he became the head of, TV, of the TV research department at RCA the very same year that David Sarnoff became that company's president. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, David Sarnoff was uh, the chairman of the board for a very long time for the Radio Corporation of America, and he is uh, the museum's namesake. So Sarnoff is president of RCA really wanted the company, which was all of 11 years old at that point, to be first at something. And when faced with the possibility of a difficult to establish color TV system or an easier to develop monochrome system, Sarnoff much preferred the latter. So the focus of RCA's fledgling efforts in television turned to an all electronic black and white TV system. And that all electronic part would differentiate it from earlier mechanical systems that were plagued with low definition. But the fact that it was monochromes and not color would speed up development immensely. Uh, that didn't mean, as we'll see in a sec, that RCA abandoned color completely. It just took a back seat to black and white. Goldmark, on the other hand, he was going all in with color. Around the same time that Baird was demonstrating his stereoscopic color TV system in London in the early 1940s, Goldmark was hard at work with his own color system. And it was something called a field sequential system. And actually both RCA's and CBS's very early television research focused on field sequential television. So that system relied on two uh, synchronized mechanically rotating tri-colored fi tri filters like the one you have in the PowerPoint over here. One of these filters was in front of the camera and the other was in front of the receiver. So as you can see on these filters, uh, the colors are a little bit muted, but there is one section in red, one section in green, and one section in blue. Um, and this, uh, this, this filter would spin in front of both your camera and your receiver. Um, and the images were repeated frequently enough so that the three colored images basically would merge in your brain, thanks to the phenomenon of persistence of vision, to create the illusion of a single picture in multiple colors. So using these uh, three colors spinning very rapidly across a monochrome image, you can get the illusion of color. So RCA began its first research into field sequential te color television in 1939, and it did create a few functioning systems using these color wheels, but it was nowhere near as advanced as the CBS system under Peter Goldmark. So here's a diagram that might help you understand a little bit better how these images were made. So you've got your your red section, your green section, and your blue section, you have an image uh, that is um, shown in a portion of that spinning disc. Um, the, 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 the disc spins and you get, again, the illusion of color. So 
In the late 1930s, Goldmark developed a very sophisticated field sequential color system that used an electronic TV camera coupled with a mechanical spinning disc like this. And the resulting color was actually spectacular. And it was compa comparable in quality to the Technicolor motion pictures of the era. And Goldmark was so pleased with this system that he demonstrated it to CBS executives in 1940. And the executives felt so positive about it that they actually arranged for Goldmark to show it to FCC commissioners a few months later. And CBS also started a publicity campaign for this system. And that publicity campaign was necessary because of what had happened a year earlier. For that, we have to visit New York, specifically the World's Fair that was held in New York City in 1939. Uh, that World's Fair was dedicated to the House of Tomorrow, and what better thing to put in the House of Tomorrow than television. It was at the World's Fair that RCA showcased the marvels of black and white television to an awestruck audience. Um, and it was where um, their all electronic monochrome television system first made its big splash. So here's a picture of David Sarnoff. He's opening the RCA exhibit at the World's Fair and he's being televised by uh, NBC cameras. And here's one of these televisions. Uh, this one is made out of clear lucite. Um, so you can see the inner workings of the television inside of it. And you can see people are gathering around to see this weird marvel that brings moving images without wires from faraway places. So in 1939, there was television already. Um, but it wasn't a widespread phenomenon, at least not yet. There were only about a handful of manufacturers making TVs and fewer than a dozen experimental black and white TV stations across the country. Um, and also these stations were by and large still experimental. Uh, what both manufacturers and consumers were waiting for was for the FCC to settle on a TV standard and regulate the airwaves so that commercial broadcasting could begin. So in 1939, all uh, RCA, NBC broadcasts and other experimental broadcasts, they were, um, they were not commercial. They couldn't advertise on the air because the FCC still hadn't decided on a standard. So this is where the CBS publicity campaign came in. So RCA was leaning on the FCC quite heavily so that they would adopt the RCA TV standard. And RCA was hoping very much that it would include um, codifying monochrome TV. Specifically, they wanted their system of black and white television. Uh, but CBS was not on board with that. Uh, they thought black and white was too limiting. And a few other people agreed with them. So what we have here is a 1941 article in Life magazine about CBS's color television. You can see in the middle here, uh, Goldmark, uh, he is holding his, uh, his color filter. And you can see a couple of images of television screens that are broadcasting in color. So this article points out that while it was true that the resolution of detail in CBS's color system was weaker than in its black and white counterpart, still CBS was able to reproduce all colors in the visible spectrum. From they had color television. And the article concludes by saying, quote, there is every reason to believe that all television programs in the future will be transmitted in color. And CBS, uh, in, in sort of making this publicity campaign, they were raising two pressing questions. First, there was the issue of the radio spectrum. So color, um, the color system that they developed takes more bandwidth than black and white television. So CBS's system in 1941 uh, proposed using a 16 megahertz channel, and that was almost three times as wide as the six megahertz system that RCA proposed. And since the radio spectrum is finite and only a portion of it was allocated to television, this meant that with the CBS system, there could only be two TV channels instead of RCA's proposed six. So that's kind of a problem already. 
But another question, and this one more in CBS's favor, was why should we settle on black and white on a black and white convention now if color TV is clearly just around the corner? And CBS really hammered that point in the press. Um, if they convinced the public, at least, that color was right around the corner um, and it was premature for the FCC to set standards for a technology that was going to become obsolete anyway, they might have more of a chance in getting their color system in the door. But unfortunately for CBS, things didn't really work out for them. Uh, Bowing to pressure from manufacturers, chief among them RCA, who really wanted to start to commercialize television now, the FCC adopted its television standards. And the television standards were um, broadcast at 6 megahertz, 525 scanning lines, and black and white. And with the standards set, commercial broadcasts were finally allowed to begin in the United States in July of 1941. But still, CBS's first petition to the FCC did something important. Uh, CBS was able to prove that color TV was feasible. Um, and it did manage also to extract a promise from the National Television Standards Committee, the NTSC, that they would form a panel on the topic of color television. Uh, but of course, before any of that could happen, World War II occurred, or the US entered World War II, I should say. So the war put questions of commercial television on hold, although TV research did continue in the context of military applications, things like television guided bombs and infrared televisions. Um, but as soon as 1945 rolled around, America was finally at peace and Americans were ready to enjoy peacetime prosperity. Machines that had built tanks and guns pivoted to creating radios and refrigerators and newfangled television receivers. So sales for televisions were really anemic before the war. There wasn't a whole lot to watch. You had to be in very specific markets to be able to get a broadcast, and the receivers were very expensive. Um, but thanks to research done in the, in the war period, post-war sets were not only much better, they were also much cheaper. So everyone wanted to start to buy one and they were buying black and white sets. But meanwhile, in terms of color, RCA had actually always maintained their color research program, even while the company pushed for all electronic uh, black and white TV. And RCA's color program gained some renewed focus after 1939 uh, debut of, of black and white television, and even more so after the end of the war. So RCA actually had two color systems in the works. One of them used a color wheel, the other one used a color drum. And the company was also working on a stereoscopic color television system. And that's our 3D, 3D TV system number two. Uh, for some reason in the 20s, 30s, and early 40s, uh, researchers and engineers really thought that if you were going to have very lifelike television, it not only had to be in color, but it had to be uh, stereoscopic. It had to be sort of three-dimensional. Um, and it's also important to note that these RCA systems, like CBS's, were actually partially mechanical. That is, they either relied on a rotating color disc or a rotating drum to produce images. So while RCA's monochrome system was all electronic and had no moving parts, their early color system was, like CBS's, a hybrid mechanical electronic system. So the photo we have over here is of a 1945 experimental color television system. This one used a rotating disc uh, with, um, with polarizing filters inside of the camera. So these filters were alternatively polarized either vertically or horizontally so that the alternating left and right hand pictures uh, could be merged onto a cathode ray tube and you can see the resulting image if you are wearing specialized glasses again in three dimensions. When everything worked correctly, um, the viewer could see not only in color but in 3D. 
And RCA successfully demonstrated the system in December of 1945 with a transmission that originated in RCA's Princeton laboratory, not too far from where I am right now, and viewed at the nearby Princeton Inn, uh, which is now um, demolished and Route 1 is in the way of that. So this system was technically a success, um, but it wasn't really a great system. The eyepieces were too cumbersome for easy viewing. Uh, so RCA decided to get rid of the whole 3D television and 3D television is still perhaps a thing of the future. Um, and here's actually the small experimental color TV studio that RCA was working with. This was in RCA labs and you can see it's not a big huge deal because RCA was more focused on black and white television. Although they had their color television system, it was not something that was on the forefront of their research programs. Meanwhile, though, CBS was also working in the post-war period on perfecting the color television system they first demonstrated in 1941. So CBS reasoned that they were never going to beat RCA at black and white television. RCA put most of their resources at black and white. So CBS thought if you know, we focus not on black and white television, but if we focus on color television, we might have a chance of beating RCA while they're too busy focusing on black and white. And that's what they were really hoping to do in 1946 when they were finally confident enough to go up once again before the FCC to petition the agency for commercial color television. And CBS was making a petition to put color television on a different part of the electromagnetic spectrum, on the ultra high frequency or UHF bands. And now the color wars were really on. So there were quite a few participants in the fight for color television standards, a lot of people, a lot of companies. But for this talk, I'm going to focus on the two main players. So in one corner, ding, 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 is David Sarnoff and RCA, along with its subsidiary NBC. And coming out fighting in the other corner was the Columbia Broadcasting System, headed by William Paley. So CBS was born from the Columbia Graphophone Company. They were born from a record company and they had made the transition into radio in the 1920s. And while they were a radio giant and probably NBC's greatest rival in radio broadcasting, they still hadn't by the 1940s managed to get a robust television network going. But they hoped that with their continued work on color TV, that they would be able to sort of enter the marketplace um, as not just um, a television broadcasting company, but as a leader, a pioneer in color. So round one of the color wars is in 1946. And 1946 seemed like a really good year to adopt a color TV standard. Uh, television sets had not yet saturated the market. There were an estimated 6,000 black and white TVs in the US in 1946. And while that was a lot, um, it was still a manageable number if everybody had to, for example, switch to a different color television system. That's what CBS thought at least. And CBS definitely gambled on this, um, this FCC hearing. So in 1946, the FCC um, convenes a hearing on technicolor television systems and specifically uh, to think about whether or not they would move color television to the ultra high frequency spectrum. And CBS was actually so confident that the FCC would rule in their favor that they even bought up a bunch of ultra high frequency TV stations in anticipation of their newly formed color network. A decision that was really going to hurt them financially down the line. And it's, it's not it was not naive of CBS to be so confident. In fact, the, F the outgoing FCC chairman, a guy called James L. Fly, he even came out in public support for the CBS system. So Peter Goldmark officially brings his system before the FCC. And the system 
was very similar to the one he brought in 1941. Uh, it used a little bit less bandwidth. It was a 12 and a half megahertz um, channel, um, but it had double the line resolution of the 1941 system. So it takes up less space on the spectrum and it had better, um, better resolution. But it was like the earlier system, a field sequential system. That is, it used a spinning color wheel. So it was partially mechanical, partially electronic. And once again, CBS mounted a huge publicity campaign, holding dozens of demonstrations for the press and doing almost daily broadcasts to CBS receivers in department stores all around New York City. So what did RCA bring to that fight in 1946? Well, they brought something called the Trinoscope. It was the very first all electronic color television system. But even at the time, RCA even admitted that the Trinoscope system was not a very good system, and nor was it very practical. Uh, but RCA, uh, in their petition to the FCC, said, it's not just our system that is experimental and impractical. All color television systems are experimental and, and impractical, regardless of what CBS might tell you. But what was really novel about RCA's system was that it was all electronic. So in an attempt to differentiate themselves from CBS, they, um, they stopped working on their own hybrid mechanical electronic systems. And they decided that much like their monochrome system, they were going to go all electronic. So, in that respect, it was um, the, the Trinoscope system was very much like their successful black and white system. Here's a, a picture of the receiving set with some diagrams to sort of show you what's going on. And there's a lot going on here. So the receiving set had three separate kinescopes. Uh, kinescopes are cathode ray tubes that are used for receiving TV images. So these three, three kinescopes would separately receive the signals representing red blue and green images, and they would be projected as a composite image onto the screen. So you can sort of see the back of the screen here and the front of the screen over here. So this uh, system was not great. Um, any sort of projection-based systems are going to be very dim. And also, as you might be able to guess from all of the stuff going on, this was not exactly a light system. This was not your uh, portable set. But this huge monster was what the FCC had for the, sorry, what RCA had for the FCC when they went before the 1946 color television hearings. And it went over about as well as a soggy blanket. So you can actually see how large the Trinoscope is uh, from this photo. This is a photo taken at a demonstration to the press in October 1946 of the Trinoscope system. So uh, standing over here in front of the TV systems is Elmer Engstrom, who was the executive vice president of research and engineering. And he was showing off that year's commercial and experimental sets. So over here, you see that's the 1946 black and white tabletop model that had just come out. And it's a cute, tiny little thing. But on the other hand, right behind him, those are the two Trinoscope models. Uh, and they're not resting on blocks. Those are the whole things. So these television apparatuses, they weighed about a ton. Um, if anyone's ever had to move an old television, you know that they're not exactly light. Um, I've had to move a lot of old televisions. I can tell you they are not light, uh, but I would not be able to move a trinoscope system on my own. But it wasn't just that they were heavy and awkward. They also didn't really work that well. Even in official publicity photos like this for the system, no one really looks all that impressed. It's not even clear that the system is working. So you can see here uh, for this promotional photograph, it sort of looks like they've scotch taped a tr uh, transparency over the TV screen to make it look like there's a clear color image instead of whatever terrible image uh, was actually coming out of the Trinoscope system. I mean, look at this guy. That is the face of a guy who knows that his system is not ready. 
And in side-by-side -side tests, the CBS system blew RCA out of the water. And it seemed as if the CBS system was sure to be adopted. Um, it, um, it was early enough that switching to a different system would, have been, would not have been too onerous for the American consumer. It produced good quality images. It seemed to be reliable. Um, what on earth could have stopped it? And folks were pretty feel, sorry, folks were feeling pretty good on the CBS side in March of 1947 when the FCC was set to issue its ruling. But the FCC stunned everybody by actually denying CBS's petition for ultra high frequency television. So they agreed with RCA's point that color in general was not yet market ready. And uh, the official reason uh, that the FCC gave was that they thought that, the C that CBS hadn't done enough field testing. So historians by and large agree that field testing wasn't actually the real issue. Uh, instead, the FCC had actually been burned from a 1945 decision where they moved the FM radio broadcasting bands. So in 1945, they shifted things around and um, that decision proved very controversial because it made a lot of radios obsolete and, and it earned a lot of ill will for the FCC. So the FCC was very concerned with doing another reshuffling of the electromagnetic spectrum, especially one so, uh, so close to their, their previous uh, poorly received shuffling. And also the FCC was concerned with the possible forced obsolescence of old black and white sets because the CBS system uh, was not compatible with the old system. It's important to note though, neither was the Trinoscope system. So the system that RCA presented, it also was not compatible. Um, but coincidentally, uh, six months after the FCC's ruling where the FCC denied CBS's petition, the FCC chairman actually left his position because he got a really good new job. He was, uh, he became the vice president at NBC. Uh, NBC, of course, owned by RCA. Uh, CBS was not very happy when they found out about that and uh, successfully lobbied for regulations against uh, FCC chair people joining uh, industry so close to the end of their tenure. But at any rate, um, CBS lost the first round of the color wars. So now it's time for round two. So at the end of 1947, at the end of March of 1947, RCA was beyond relieved. The adoption of the color, uh, the color TV standard would not have only caused the obsolescence of older TV sets, it would, have been, it would have been really bad for RCA because RCA sold a lot of televisions. And again, the problem is that if the CBS system is not backwards compatible with existing technology, if the FCC were to adopt the CBS color standard, people would begin to buy color TV receivers with patented CBS technology. So if RCA wanted to make color sets with this system, they would actually have to license the technology from CBS. And that would have been a really bitter pill to swallow. So after they had successfully stalled the 1946 FCC color decision, RCA turned again to black and white TV, thinking that was their wheelhouse and they had more time to develop it to be a much better system. Um, and what they were doing with black and white TV actually was research and development for UHF TV. Um, because they thought that the FCC would have to be forced to change the television allocation, the television spectrums allocate, sorry, the radio spectrums allocation for television. And while RCA was right that the FCC would eventually turn to the UHF band to allocate more channels to the growing medium, they perhaps weren't expecting them to convene hearings about not just UHF, but also color TV at the same time. So that's what, C that's what FCC did in September of 1949. Here's an uh, article from the uh, Philadelphia Inquirer. So the FCC has a hearing to study the doubling of TV outlets by moving it to the ultra high frequency band, but also as a result, they were also, they were going to consider 
the question of color television. And the problem was RCA didn't exactly have a good color television system to show the FCC. CBS, on the other hand, was far more prepared uh, because while RCA redoubled its work on black and white TV, Goldmark had worked still more on his field sequential color system. So the 1949 iteration had better resolution and it could be transmitted on the standard six megahertz channel. So it's more resolution for less bandwidth. What's not to love? It was, of course, still a field sequential system, meaning that it did have a spinning disk and it was a, um, and it was, you know, had all the problems of mechanical systems. But at least uh, Goldmark had managed to modify the system so that the uh, size of the color wheel actually no longer adversely affected TV set size. So it was still a nice compact TV set, but the most problematic issue remained was that CBS's system was not backwards compatible with other black and white sets already on the market. And the problem was the number of black and white sets was increasing rapidly. So what did RCA bring to this fight? Uh, CBS brought their uh, improved field sequential system. RCA knew that their trinoscope system was awful, so they went to a different system. They proposed what was called a dot sequential system. So their system used three camera tubes to produce simultaneous red, green, and blue signals. So while this system had the advantage that it was compatible with monochrome standards, its quality, well, let's say it left a lot to be desired. So it was, that was putting it nicely, the quality was terrible. About a month into the color hearings, um, RCA and CBS both agreed to do a public side-by-side -side demonstration of their systems. And the CBS's demo, CBS's demo went fine. After all, they'd been working on this technology for quite a bit. RCA, on the other hand, ended up with egg on its face. So their press demo of this dot sequential system was really an unmitigated disaster. And the images were so poor that Variety magazine lambasted the company saying that they had, quote, laid an off color egg. But still RCA kept in the fight with the FCC and it ended up being a really long, really contentious battle. Um, so the central period that we'll be talking about for the rest of the talk is 1949 to 1953. And over that time period, there were a grand total of three different committees that were established to study and report about uh, color television systems. Uh, for this particular round of the color wars, there were four different uh, companies competing for three different types of systems. But again, I'll focus on RCA and CBS. So the first committee that, uh, con that was convened was something called the Joint Technical Advisory Committee that reported directly to the FCC. And then there was the Senate Advisory Committee, which unsurprisingly reported to the Senate. And finally, there was the National Television Standards Committee or the NTSC. So all four television, all four color TV systems were put through rigorous tests in various environments for the FCC. They were tested in the lab, in public settings, um, receiving sets were put in homes and tested there, all in order to determine once and for all the best color TV system. But the criteria for the best system, however, was more than just picture quality. Dependability and cost effectiveness cost effectiveness was in the mix, as was the desire for a system that would be the least disruptive to existing color sets. So there's a lot that needed to be juggled. The FCC had a lot on its plate. The Senate Advisory Committee was actually the first to reach a decision, and they reached a decision in July of 1950. But the an annoying thing was that it wasn't much of a decision. Um, they declined to make any clear recommendations, which kind of feels like a cop out to me. And they said that, quote, the committee believes that the decision to adopt a system must include considerations of many social and economic factors, not properly the concern of the technical analysts. They were basically saying, 
we're engineers um, and there are more than engineering questions at stake. So instead, what they decided to do was they would rank the systems. So they said RCA was better in compatibility, flicker, and effective channel utilization, uh, while CBS was the best in color fidelity and convertibility. So in other words, CBS had the best color, but that didn't mean, according to the Senate committee, that they had the best system. So the FCC used the Senate Advisory Committee report alongside data gathered by the two other committees and came to a decision in May of 1950. So after over 10,000 total pages of transcripts, after 256 exhibits, after months of deliberation, the FCC was finally ready to make a decision. So, oops, sorry. Uh, they put out a report on color television in September of 1950. And unfortunately for everybody involved, it didn't actually report on anything. It turns out the Senate Advisory Committee wasn't the only one having trouble making a decision. The FCC's report favored the CBS field sequential system uh, because they said RCA's color was unsatisfactory. Um, they also said that RCA's dot sequential system was too complex and the RCA receivers were quote, so bulky, so complicated, so difficult to operate, and so expensive that it is inconceivable that the public would purchase them in any quantity. But the thing is, the FCC didn't actually formally adopt the CBS system either. Instead, they expressed a concern about the compatibility issue, and they urged CBS to come up with a compatible version of their field sequential system. And they further said that they would formally adopt the CBS system if manufacturers began to make receivers that were capable of picking up both the CBS color and the standard black and white signals. That was a decision that pleased exactly zero people, um, probably because it didn't make a firm decision. Again, so we are now, you know, round two of the color wars and nobody has made any sort of decision. So under mounting pressure from all sides, CBS finally caved and made a clear decision in October of 1950. And it was not the decision that RCA was hoping for. So October 11th, 1950, the FCC formally adopted the CBS system as the standard for color television. And Frank Stanton, then CBS's president and a staunch supporter of color TV, got his face on the cover of Time magazine. So although their system wouldn't ultimately win out in the market, it did seem uh, in December of 1950 when this issue came out that CBS had won the color wars. But then how do we explain this time cover from a few months later? This is July of 1951. Also, how can we explain the fact that none of you guys remember color TV sets with spinning wheels in front of them? Well, the reason was uh, RCA. So RCA, I think, was blindsided by the October 1950 FCC decision. They were used to running out the clock on FCC hearings. And after all, this is CBS's fourth attempt at getting the FCC to ratify their system. And they were unsuccessful. So RCA assumed that they would be unsuccessful once again. Um, but they weren't the only ones who were upset. The FCC decision was actually not too popular with the TV industry as a whole. And it actually took RCA all of a week to file a suit against the FCC in the Chicago Federal District, District Court. So calling the FCC decision, quote, arbitrary and cap capricious, RCA argued that the agency had actually overstepped its bounds and failed uh, to protect public interest in approving a system that was not compatible with existing receiving sets. There was no mention in the lawsuit that RCA also stood to lose a lot of money on TV, uh, as a result of that decision, but that was probably in the mix. But the central point of the case that RCA made was that a system not compatible with existing television sets would not be in the public interest. And that was hard to ignore. 
Uh, the resulting court case and an injunction actually prevented CBS from taking ad money for color television for seven months, and it really stalled their research. But nevertheless, FCC did seem to be initially victorious. The Chicago courts upheld the FCC decision. Um, RCA appealed, the case went all the way up to the Supreme Court in the spring of 1951, and the Supreme Court also sided with the FCC and CBS but not on necessarily technical merits, but because in the words of Chief Justice Frankfurter, quote, courts should not overrule an, an administrative decision merely because they disagree with its wisdom. So it was basically, okay, maybe RCA has a technical point, but that's not the issue. But at any rate, the delay was a huge blow to CBS. CBS. In the seven months that passed, the number of black and white TV sets had increased by 50%, so that now there were an estimated 12 million black and white sets in the United States. RCA had also convinced major television manufacturers not to produce sets capable of receiving CBS's color system, which was also a problem because CBS didn't have its own manufacturing capabilities. And finally, by the time the court's decision finally went down and CBS could continue commercial work, the Korean War had escalated. And it was uh, getting harder and harder to uh, feasibly build pricey and material rich color TV sets. So while RCA may have lost the case, uh, the delay not just hobbled CBS's efforts, it completely destroyed them. So central to RCA's court case was the issue of compatibility. Uh, though CBS de developed adapters that would allow CBS color transmission to be received in black and white and converters that would allow color viewing on black and white sets, RCA still argued that CBS's system, adapters notwithstanding, was not a compatible one and that it would lead set owners to throw out their existing TVs. And that would in turn lead to a waste of both money and crucial for the material salvage efforts of the Korean War, materials. So while the debate about the incompatible CBS system was fought in the courts, RCA engineers were hard at work developing an alternative to both the CBS system and their own less than stellar dot sequential system. And it was all hands on deck at RCA for the search for a good compatible system. According to Hannah Chapman Moody, one of the engineers who worked on the eventual compat compatible color system, RCA's Princeton Labs initiated basically a massive search in the literature and in the research books um, for color TV systems, anything that RCA had already been working on to see if anything showed any promise. So RCA called it their crash program. And between the FCC's decision in 1950 and the end of 1952, RCA spent a million and a half dollars on the project. A year and a half, a million and a half dollars in 1950. It was a lot of money. The end result was the creation of five different color television tube designs. And after careful consideration, research managers decided the most promising was the shadow mask system, first developed by Alfred Schroeder for RCA in 1946. It eventually became the centerpiece of RCA's all electronic compatible color TV system. So while the complexity of the shadow mask picture tube hindered early mass production, it eventually found a place in almost all 20th century color TVs, uh, color televisions, thanks to yet another round of study panels, this time organized by the National Television Standards Council, or the NTSC, in the summer of 1951. By the fall of 1952, RCA was ready to submit their system to the NTSC. So while CBS continued to try and promote the high quality of their, color of their color, RCA really doubled down on the compatibility issue and also dangled the possibility of a smooth end to the color wars. And the NTSC was impressed enough to recommend the, the RCA compatible shadow mask system to the FCC, even though the quality of RCA's color left a lot to be desired. In fact, the RCA color system was so bad that some engineers quipped that the NTSC now stood for never the same color or never twice, um, ne never twice the same color. Yes. 
So with the NTSC stamp of approval, RCA went back to the FCC. This was to be the last petitions to the FCC regarding color TV for a while. Perhaps worn out by the decades of debates, the FCC formally reversed their 1950 decision and adopted the all electronic RCA system in 1953. The color wars were finally over. RCA emerged victorious, but at a cost. In sacrificing quality color for compatibility, the next battle RCA had to face was actually convincing people to buy them. So they started selling TVs. This uh, 1953 TV sold for an astounding $995. That's $2,600 today. The picture quality was very, very poor. So by the late 1950s, the color wars were over and there was a clear winner. Yet for most people, if they happen to watch this, hope it works. <laughs> The following program is brought to you in living color on NBC. So if they watch that, they probably would have seen that peacock in brilliant black and white. So why did people start to buy color TVs when they had a perfectly good black and white set at home? Well, the answer to that is a subject for another day, but that day, or rather those days, will be coming soon. First of all, if you had the chance to see the moon in color, wouldn't you want to go for it? Well, to learn about RCA's work with the color uh, cameras that brought the moon into American living rooms, be sure to tune back in two weeks from now. We've got uh, Sam Russell, who is going to be speaking about RCA's contribution to the space race. Uh, we were really lucky to have Sam give a talk at the museum last year. It was standing room only. It was great. Um, so you definitely don't want to miss uh, this talk. Um, you can find a, a link to register for the talk on our website. Um, also, you know what else might convince people to buy color TVs? Good TV shows. And that'll be the subject of our next talk, which will be on Sunday, June 14th at 1.30. Depending on public health issues, we don't know if it will be live or Zoom, but keep an eye out um, on our website and you will find out why exactly Sarnoff was a Klingon. All right, thank you so much uh, for listening. In the meantime, if you want to fill the hours between now and Sam's talk, you can check out our website. We've got a lot of blog posts about different materials. You can follow us on social media. So thank you so much 